Good morning and welcome to the Monday Call. I'm Stefan Clark, Chief Client Officer at NZ Funds, and I'm joined by Mark Brooks, Head of Income and Principal at the firm too. They say technology is eating the world. From the simplest of tasks to the most complex challenges, technology is reshaping the fabric of our societies and creating incredible opportunities for investors. After a difficult 2022, the US tech heavy, heavy index, the NASDAQ, has been the best performing major index worldwide, driven up by investor optimism around AI and the resilience of the sector. This week, we're joined by Rainer Dobelman, investment officer at MFS Inter Investment Management to discuss investing in technology, the latest trends, and where MFS see the current opportunities. MFS manage over 400 billion US of assets for individuals, families, and institutions around the world, and is one of a select group of investment managers NZ Funds partners with. Rainer, it is a delight to have you here. Welcome. Um, Thank I you. believe where you are, it's the morning. Uh, whereabouts are you? And, um, and if you wouldn't mind, well, uh, tell us a little bit about your role and um, how you found yourself at MFS. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm in uh, Holland, just outside The Hague, um, where it's a uh, gray and rainy 18 degrees Celsius, um, which is reasonably typical for a Dutch summer, but I don't mind. I actually enjoy enjoy this. I enjoy all the weather also when it's sunny. But um, and uh, MFS at MFS, I um, I run a technology portfolio uh, and also I'm sector head, co-sector head for uh, technology. We're heading up our technology team of analysts who advise the portfolio managers. Uh, and collectively, analysts at MFS manage about 40 billion US. It's probably a larger number today, um, but it's a significant part of the total assets that we manage is managed directly by analyst teams. Um, and that actually is why I joined MFS. Uh, everyone at MFS is an investor. Analysts are not you know, librarians or historians. We're there to generate alpha directly. Uh, and it makes communication with the portfolio managers much easier. We're all on the same page in terms of how we think about the stocks and trying to refine you know, the excess of information we get every day into information that is relevant to generating alpha. Right. Oh, and um, what you drew you to, I guess, technology and um, building a career in that sector? I just, um, I went to business school in California at Berkeley and uh, it was early 90s and I was super excited about what could happen with technology. I, you know, computers, PCs were the thing at the time. And, and then uh, tragically, <laughs> After business school, I moved to Japan and I'd, you know, done projects on Oracle and software. And I was going to do uh, a neural programming project with one of my B school professors. I went early to Japan and for 20 years, oh, 95 to 2000, I think it's fair to say that for 20 years, Japan was the graves, graveyard of technology, especially software. <laughs> um, so, uh, in a way, that was a horrible <laughs> experience because um, I was watching from the sidelines just the whole Bay Area, San Francisco, Berkeley, exploding with innovation. And, uh, you know, I, I was in Japan where it, it was going the other way. Um, but it was a fantastic experience as an investor because it was a bear market and uh, there was multiple contraction and. Uh, I learned how to deal with that. And that's a that's a rare experience that not many investors, at least at U.S. firms, have had. Uh, so it does help, you know, inform my investment process. I, and probably contextualize the last couple of years, perhaps. Yeah. Although, you know, this the sort of the COVID and post COVID environment is like nothing I've ever seen. You know, Japan was a grind and a lot of rotation. Um, and this has been sort of like a, a roller coaster in space uh, because, you know, you have unreliable information coming from, you know, multiple sources. You have an environment of fear. We're all, you know, and, and dislocation. You know, a lot of people experienced 
a, a, a huge variety of dislocations during the COVID period, and not to mention, you know, sickness and death in some cases. Um, so, you know, a lot of emotional impact on the thinking process. And then just a stock market, which, you know, the U.S. provided, what, $5 trillion in stimulus or something, and then a, a quarter of GDP, roughly. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, 22, very tough down market, but very fast. And then over in October and up we go again. And, you know, so it's, um, this, is, this is more like being, you know, being like a bug on the tail end of a whip and going, whoom, you know, you're still on the whip, but <laughs> you're getting shaken up and shaken down. And yeah. Has, has that changed the way in which you think about stocks? Because obviously when it's hard to see us going back to that sort of Japanese grind market. Yeah, it is. Just the um, world just gets so much quicker. Yes. Um, well, so it's not, you know, if you come into this, I, you know, it started my career with a Benjamin Graham my, mindset, you know, that textbook. Um, and you have to be flexible in an environment where capital, you know, capital costs approach is zero. Um, and understand that, you know, we're always looking at relative valuation in the first place. So, you know, a stock is not cheap or expensive on an absolute basis. We're valuing it relative to its universe. So if the universe is at 50 times PE or 10 times sales or 20 times sales, well, that's the benchmark, right? Um, which is, how, how do you sort of marry that with a Graham like starting point? I suppose that's, well, yeah, if, yeah, at a personal level, that's, kind of what I've struggled with over time is, yeah, I'm not a great tech investor myself mentally, being a bond guy, yeah, doesn't come naturally. Um, so sort of marrying that sort of value versus ex not extreme growth, but you know what I mean? Yes. Well, you know, you, you do val relative valuation. So if, you know, 10% growth is worth 30 times PE, just to pick a you know set of random numbers, not, not a historical number. Um, then you try to deal with it. But obviously on a human level, you know, we, that's, that's uncomfortable. You know, it, you, it, you, I can't get past that really. I mean, emotionally. So it just makes it difficult. Uh, it's still, you know, a relative game in the sense that, you know, you're looking for the best, most sustainable growth and returns at the best price. Uh, so that part of the discipline is still important, you know, accurately trying to measure yep. the growth, accurately trying to predict what returns will be. And that's a function of industry structure. You know, how competitive is it? How deep are the moats? Uh, is this a business that has, you know, sort of a virtuous cycle at the, you know, the network effect, like the, the bigger they get, the bigger they get and the harder they get to dislodge. Um, th those things still apply, but they're happening but there's also a level of arbitrariness and a willingness by the market to sort of buy things on faith and not test them. And since there's no capital discipline, you can get away with these sort of fantasy scenarios for, for longer, uh, yep. which is frustrating <laughs> for, for curmudgeon, curmudgeonly analysts. That's frustrating. And do you separate within a sector, US names versus global, because otherwise you're probably going to end up always buying the global because it may be, may have on, uh, yeah, on a valuation basis. So we have a, I have, and, and the team has, the analyst team has a number of different mandates and they sort of, if you think of a pyramid, at the bottom of the period, pyramid are these regional funds, like a Japan fund or an Asia X Japan fund. And, and then, you know, you get gradually more global on the way up until you're doing global. Um, and the benchmarks, even for the global portfolios, are, you know, two thirds U.S. So it tends to be somewhat in line with that. And we're not super skewed to, to any one region other than that. Um, we, in the last few years, we have added a lot to Japan because Japan has a reasonably good valuation for you know, the quality of the business you're acquiring. Uh, so an example there is Hitachi is a stock we've owned for many, many years over there and has been, you know, sort of a low, uh, under 10 PEs, now mid-teens mid PE, uh, not seen as a growth company. And sort of headline growth is negative. 
because they're divesting from businesses. So, you know, comparing to last year, they had this, you know, auto parts business. It's not here this year. So, you know, revenues look down. But if you look underneath the covers, it's growing like 10%. Uh, sort of classic some of the parts type. Yeah. Modeling. Okay. So um, we touched on COVID, but how, I mean, as a starting point for the meat and potatoes of the conversation, how do you sort of think about market dynamics today and the rise of the NASDAQ's, you know, um, seemingly uh, uh, unending rise uh, over the course of this year and the fact that the Dow's, you know, on the other side of the equation and, and you know, other markets, Australia, New Zealand, for example, Europe, definitely haven't had anything like the stellar um, run that the NASDAQ has. How do you think about, um, you know, tech versus you know, industrials and um, more cyclical yes. stocks today. Yes. So first a caveat, um, I'm I'm a bottom up investor, bottom up fundamental investor. So any comments I have about markets or macro, um, you know, you're, you're not asking the most qualified person around. Um, and I don't have a lot of faith in like predicting indices. Um, but I'll say, you know, we try to, you know, we try to be aware of the environment that the NASDAQ environment, the tech environment in the U.S. is hot. Uh, and I agree that we don't see that in other markets where technology stocks trade. If you look at Samsung Electronics or TSMC, you know, widely recognized global technology companies, they have underperformed. You know, on a one year basis, they've underperformed the U.S. technology stocks. Uh, obviously, Taiwan China semis on like a 20 times PE or something even less, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and uh, China technology stocks are the, 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 the bloom is off the rose there as well. And it doesn't look like that's going to come back. Um, certainly not driven by, you know, non-Chinese investors just because of the geopolitical situation. And as a U.S. investor, you can't be sure that you'll be allowed to invest in China in the next five years. It might continue. I hope it continues. I hope we all stay friendly. But, you know. Uh, there are there could be increasing restrictions on what we're allowed to do. Um, so uh, how do we deal with it? Let me get back to your question then on, you know, how do we think about the NASDAQ and, and U.S. tech stocks? Again, it's a relative game and we're being forced to play in a more valuation aggressive, high valuation environment. Um, at the same time, I think there's a clear secular driver now, and it's still relatively small, but for the next, at least for the next three to five years, it's going to be really important. And that's AI. That's sort of the killer app. You know, uh, uh, it, it was funny. We, we visited NVIDIA in um, June and Jensen Wan came. He's very generous with his time. And, and you know, one of the things he said is like, AI is the killer app. I hate that word. I don't want to kill anybody. But it's the reason why you need to have NVIDIA equipment, because, as you put it, AI is like money squirting out of computers. The, the, the monetization is so quick, assuming you have the you know, right uh, downstream set of apps, for example, Microsoft. Um, it's so quick that it's just driving a very intense investment cycle. Uh, and. I mean, that's that's typical of what you see in tech. You know, the first uh, spreadsheet cut to VisiCalc in the early 80s, Lotus 1, 2, 3, maybe you remember, those made PCs suddenly relevant in the business in environment. Um, and this is, you know, another iteration of that only on turbo and steroids. And that sort of takes us, I suppose, maybe down a tangent of the, of the uh, semiconductor space. It does seem that going forward there's, yeah, no shortage of chips but there's a real shortage of the right chips and yes. how long that typically that's been a it's been a very defined semiconductor cycle over time yes where do you sort of think we are in that process well going back to first principles on semis and i'm a semis analyst um and have been for most of my career um all of my career um the the thing that drives this cycle is the mismatch in timing between demand and the ability to add capacity. So it takes at least six months and often 12 to 18 months to add semiconductor capacity. 
and you know demand can change in a month or a week uh, and once you've built the capacity because the fixed costs associated are so high uh, if you have too much it has a you know the incremental profits the effect on margins is really really high so just to baseline that for the audience um, it's true that uh, so this is one of the it's the only th semiconductor cycle I can think of where there is high dispersion between semiconductor economics companies but also the stocks so Nvidia should be doing really well and it is <laughs> um, but if you take a you know a tier two foundry it's tough even for TSMC, you know, they're seeing declining profits in the last quarter, I think. And so anyway, it's a horrible quarter. Q1, Q2 are horrible. For, for the memory companies, also Samsung, Hynix, et cetera, uh, you know, the first negative margins. In fact, the only negative quarterly margins I can recall for Samsung Electronics going back into to 99. Um, and it'll be, a, I think, a loss-making year for, for memory for them. And that's also a, a first and who would have thought that in an industry with three players, right? Where margins going into pre-down cycle were 40, 50, as high, almost 70% in 2018. Um, so uh, I think those numbers give you a little sample of how dislocated things are, how different from the past and how outside sort of the bands of standard deviation. Um, so it's a... It's exciting. Uh, it's scary. <laughs> and so is that is that a function of um, just a change in the demand, or is it more a supply side piece where they uh, ramp a up supply, scale? That's a supply, and, that magnitude is a supply side effect where they built too much capacity, and now and this is unusual in DRAM. You in, in DRAM even under bad DRAM is a memory uh, product. Sorry, it, under bad conditions. When demand is low, you still run your fab at 100% utilization because the equipment and all the facilities are so expensive that that's the cheapest way to sort of divide the cost over as many chips as you can. They were running, everyone in the industry is running like 80% or something. That's highly unusual. And, and for not just a quarter or a month, but like two quarters. Uh, so uh, why did that happen? I think it goes back to my comments about the COVID period where, uh, you know, you had that period where you couldn't get stuff. There was all that supply chain disruption and uh, there were multiple reasons for it. Some of it was that people had under underplanned capacity. Some of it was just that, you know, the truck couldn't get to your place or the ship couldn't get to your place or the checkpoints took too long because of the, the disease threat. Um, and it was a lousy information environment. And as a result, the, the memory companies overbuilt their client, their customers told them, build, 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 build. We need more. We're, you know, and you can, you know, your customers are over ordering, but you don't know if they're triple, quadruple or quintuple order. You know, you just, uh, it did. Analogy that's always used for a supply chain, like is the bullwhip effect. I, I think this is really interesting in that, you know, when you crack a whip, you move your hand, you know, I don't know how fast, but not too fast. But the end of that whip is moving supersonically. And the supersonic part is where the semiconductor makers are. So they get this customer signal and it's magnified massively. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that causes this sort of dislocation. So is NVIDIA now the envy of all chip makers because they were in a different sort of I think um, well NVIDIA place in how, what sorry go ahead go well that, that, you know, that, 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 I mean the nature of the chips is different from um, other semiconductor makers is my understanding um, yes the way I see it is is much more than a chip company um, so if you think back to the 1990s there were four companies that dominated their ecosystems it was Intel Microsoft you know the Wintel uh, that dominated PCs. And then you had Dell, who dominated the you sort of the assembly of PCs. It's a great business model for that. And then you had Cisco, who did the you know the networking between PCs and data centers as they existed back then. And they were just incredible stocks in in the 1990s. And I think Nvidia is all of those put together. 
but for this era. And the reason is they have these chips and yes, the, their GPUs are far superior to their competitions, um, particularly for certain specific AI uh, uh, applications, but they also have built a software stack around that or on top of it to, to enable people to use the chips for a more productive purpose in order to make them more turnkey. And that they've been doing that for 15 years. So they have a huge lead. Uh, and so that's the Microsoft part of it, the operating system, the chips were the Intel part. Then they have a bunch of highly specialized networking, uh, cabling protocols, IP and chips that are specific for high performance systems that do the networking between the chips because we're in a parallel processing world right? where we're, you know, you have multiple chips working together to sort of take a task apart, process it, and then put it back together. Uh, and then they also have uh, some, some broader uh, networking uh, technology that competes a little bit with Ethernet, which is the most common network, so between data center networking. And so that's the Cisco part. And then the Dell part is that they have essentially they can provide you with a solution that that you know you can plug right into your software stack. When I say you are, it takes a company like ServiceNow or Microsoft or or something you know Google uh, to to apply that. I can't do it. MFS can't do it. Just like that. Uh, probably we can't even buy the systems now. <laughs> but but uh, that's how it works. So it's very very powerful position that. You know, has that has some durability to it. Five, ten years would be my guess. Before the competition catch up. But yeah, before I mean, so I think current market share is around ninety percent. That might go to eighty percent, but then you're at a solid eighty percent, and you stay there for a long time until some new disruption comes along. Yeah. Okay. A lot of this rests on this. Uh, I guess the, and I can see you're really enthusiastic about the impact of AI. Um, yes. Yeah. And I'm so also scared. How do you, how, <laughs> yeah, well, we'll touch on that soon, but just on a, I guess, from an investor's perspective, um, a lot of capital is being, is being pushed towards AI opportunities, both at a private market and a public market sense. How do you think about, um, the impact and, um, that, that AI generally is going to have on, on society and GDP and the corporates that, um, are the customers of these um, uh, benefactors of all this investment capital? How do I think about the impact on society? Yes. Yeah. So how do you? Because obviously underpins a lot of the investment propositions that you, you know, Nvidia, for example, is it's all the, the foundation for it is AI. Yes. So you must have a, a really strong bull case for AI generally and AI demand. Yes, I, I'm going. You know, this is typical for bottom up. I'm going off their guidance revision. I'm going off the comments we've gotten from other companies in the universe. And okay. um, the, the just the history of tracking AI over the last 10 years where it's been most visible. Normally on an event like this, so the events that, that changed our minds was uh, when NVIDIA announced their results and then provided a guide for the next quarter that was insanely off base high um and uh normally i'm a seller of news you know where it's like yes yes you know in the short run we overestimate how quickly technology will change our lives but in the long run we underestimate it but i think two things so one is this last this environment since 2020 is a different environment one thing i've learned from that environment is you have to be quick um and uh, the other is AI is different in that it accelerates the rate of change. Um, there's a book called The Second Machine Age, I think, and they kind of they compare uh, the development of broad, you know, machine intelligence to uh, the Industrial Revolution and the evolution of the, the steam engine and everything that came out of that. And that happened very slowly this is going to happen really fast. And the analogy they use in the book is 
the, that chess analogy where, you know, the, the king playing chess with the person who invented chess and the inventor wins and the king says, oh, you, you can have anything you want. And the guy says, okay, I just want some rice. Like double the amount of rice that you put on each square. And, you know, it's an example of the power law and how you get exponential change. And by, by the time you're halfway across the board, you, it's filling the room. The rice is filling the room. It's so much. It's way more than you can intuitively grasp. And I think AI is like that. So we have to be really fast um, and also change fast. Like be, it won't be unidirectional or the other thing we know about technology cycles is it's never a straight line, right? It's, it's some squiggle uh, and we just have to be responsive to the data that we get. And that's from, I guess, from an investment perspective, which companies you're investing in, or do you think about it? Um, and you've got to be fast in terms of your how you transact and um, uh, yes. into positions, like, or is it more in the context of how you think about the industry more broadly and the research you're doing? Kind of all of those. Uh, so yes, we have to think about the industry and the research we're doing on a faster cadence, or at least anticipate faster change. Uh, and in terms of our investment decisions, we tend to, since we're, you know, we do a lot of things through discussion and uh, that takes time. Uh, so we're, we're not going to be the fastest house in the market and never have been. And so our, our approach to that has been to slow down even more and, you know, really pick opportunities and so typically, you know, in this example, you get revision up, stock up, two months later, stock down, next exciting thing happens, you know, slight disappointment. Oh, there's a hiccup with production or, or it didn't ship or like the plastic on the box didn't work. And, you know, because the multiple is so high, any disappointment has an effect, has an effect on the share price. Um, and that's when we would begin a position. And then you wait for opportunities like that to add to the position. You can't do that this time. You just have to get on board. And yeah, that's and uncomfortable. <laughs> Sorry. And in terms of your actual day-to-day -day research, is, has AI changed anything in that yet? Have you been able to use it in your own research? Or I wish I yet? had. Uh, there, there, you know, there's some security concerns. Like we can't just use off the shelf and like use our own queries and data, et cetera, for chat GPT. Um, and it's uh, that for the quantitative part of the work, I don't have a solution at the moment, um, or we don't have a solution. There is, so Microsoft has this thing called Copilot, uh, this application called Copilot. I don't know if it's available. We haven't rolled it out, but they, I've seen the demos where they show you, okay, this is, tell us what you want to do to just talk to the AI and tell it what you want to do and it will automate it for you. And you know, if you've worked on a computer, this is a dream because it takes away all, all the tasks that you hate, uh, the, you know, the, the rep repetitive tasks, the stuff that doesn't work, the AI is there to help you with it. That's just, that. I don't know how many dollars per month that would be worth, right? 100, 200, three, four. That's not what they're charging or going to charge or have announced that they've charged, but that's that's worth a lot. I'm just uh, immediately thinking of a whole range of things I could use it for. Like yes. Every uh, reply thanks to all emails I've received today. Um, <laughs> is it a, Mark and I, before the call, we were um, talking about AI and, um, and how it's already creating a lot of content itself. And the idea that there's a feedback loop where um, because AI is based on content that's on the internet, generally, yes. Um, it'll start learning from its own content. Yes. And eventually you're just going to have this sort of self-reinforcing feedback loop of um, AI creating more content, which does AI... It, yeah, <clears throat> does AI it eat is. itself ultimately. <laughs> yes. Well, you you see it... Um, you see it in some of the artwork. About a year ago, I started using Twitter because I felt like I had to know. I'm not on any social media except that. And that not under my own name. Um, and observing that platform and the AI, gen so people put their own videos from TikTok on there sometimes. And um, these people are 
you know, you start with a raw image and then that image is processed and processed and the skin glows and, you know, the proportions are perfect and the, you know, the head is, and, and, but there's also sort of this slight kind of offness to them. They're too round or something or too <laughs> shiny or too, so there's, you know, it's still an unsophisticated. It sounds like you're describing my head, to be honest. No, 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 <laughs> no I mean, it's like these, gee, these shoulders, the, the, um, it, so yes, AI is generating its own content and it's feeding on itself and it's probably feeding it based on views and length of engagement per image. Um, yeah, it's, uh, so that's what I mean about being in an unreliable information environment, especially if you're in media on, on social media, more, you know, we don't know how much of that content is bot driven, but I, I expect it would be a really, really high percentage, Bot, you know, automated now AI. Let's talk about companies that you're most excited about at the moment. Which what, are there particular industries or within or you know subsectors once, within technology? Once other than Nvidia, yeah. Besides <laughs> Nvidia, we've, we've, we've had the, the the plug for that. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, where else are you uh, looking? And are there um, you know what what parts of the the sector are you most focused on? Um, well, I, you know, you mentioned the Dow earlier, and the Dow I've noticed has a little had a little uptick. Uh, it's looking, starting to look like it has some energy. Um, and I think, so we own one company that's an example of this in, in the technology fund. It's Hitachi, which is historically an industrial conglomerate, everything from rice cookers to <laughs> nuclear power plants. Um, and they've decon, you know, they've, they've kind of concentrated their portfolio of businesses. So they do fewer things today, but they are still at heart uh, an industrial and IT company. And so they're really at the nexus of this taking industrial processes and implying more what we'd think of as you know, office, Microsoft office type intelligence to them or, or you know, advanced ERP enterprise resource uh, platforms. That, that are more intuitive, friendly to use and provide information that's relevant that you can make business decisions based off of. So analytics. Um, and I think that whole field is, is super exciting. You're not that, that one company, obviously, uh, but also, by the way, that's something that Microsoft is also involved in and a bunch of vertical software companies do that kind of thing. But um, also, you know, the, the Siemens is Honeywell, Schneider, those, those sorts of companies. So that's it. I think for us as people, for the stock market, that's interesting, you know, and, and I think, I don't know about the, around the world, but in the U S infrastructure is really bad. So sort of the physical world since COVID COVID is when I stopped using that phrase, software is eating the world, which I took that to mean that more and more is happening in software. More relevance is happening in software than in the physical world. COVID took us right back into the physical world and said, yeah, you have to pay attention to, to where your body is relative to other bodies, you know, relative to your house, et cetera. Um, and also we couldn't get stuff. And, and I think that shift, we're kind of cyclically in this shift where physical matters again. And, but it's happening within the context of uh, a, a software infrastructure, an internet infrastructure that has all this information in it as well. So it's different from the 80s or the 70s or, or the 90s, but it's relative to the last 20 years, it's more physical is more important. And I think there's a lot to do there. Um, I don't have a specific grasp of exactly what, you know, and how that's going to play out. But, you know, electrical grids is one. I thought she's a provider of equipment for electrical grids that are analytic that can be, that's really important in the age of renewables because renewables are unreliable. You know, the wind doesn't always blow a solar. So you have to allocate where the power is coming from intelligently and store it intelligently and shift between. So it's, you know, those things are important. Okay. And um, how do you think about the China technology industry versus the U S is that, do you, you mentioned earlier that you, you, as an investor, you're worried about being able to continue invest there, yeah. um, given geopolitical factors. But as an industry, my understanding is China is catching up 
with the you know with the US. Um, do yes. you do you think that that's true? And are you seeing particular names there that are um, are an expression of that that uh, excite you? Or or the other one I'd add to that is are they materially hampered by the chip availability of yeah truly cutting edge? Yes, oh, that's GPUs. a really serious uh, uh, set of events. Um, yeah, so I think take, I take Chinese technology very seriously. Uh, we used to own a lot of Tencent. Uh, it's a from a business and technology point of view, a great platform. You can have some ESG issues with it. Um, uh, I would say. On the software and uh, sort of internet, so hyperscale side, I would take to China very seriously. There was a period where they filed more AI patents than anybody else by you know factor of two or something. Uh, at, now, who knows, right? Patents, they're not all relevant or important, but so I take it very seriously. You know, they have the scale, they have the quality of education, they have good infrastructure. So those are, it's a powerful combination uh, of, for generating innovation and products that have value. Uh, I would say though that, so I, it, it's hard for me as a, as a technology investor based in the US to do much. Because again, I'm worried that, uh, you know, unpredictably I'll be told, Rainier, you, we gotta get out. Uh, you know, we can't own this stuff anymore. And, and, you know, hopefully you have a window, but then you're selling with everybody else. I, that's an uncomfortable environment. Um, uh, you know, I don't think things will get hot or kinetic. I hope they don't, you know, and I hope things in general will get better because I think the world's better off when we're all, you know, we have our disagreements, but we remain friends. Um, on the, the, so what the U.S. have done with the, with the chip equipment sanctions, those are, I mean, those are crippling to, to China's semiconductor industry. So you're stuck five years behind the rest of the world, basically forever, as long as those uh, restrictions apply. You know, if, the US, if this had been done to the US, I think the US would call it an act of war. It's very, um, it's quite aggressive. And, you know, I agree something has to be done but this is very aggressive. Um, so, uh, you know, that said, though, uh, China has China's local chip industry, mostly tier two foundry. Uh, they're reasonably good at sort of the 28 nanometer and slightly better uh, node level. And, uh, you know, that's perfectly viable. It's just subscale for them. So what I hear from my companies is that they're, you know, buying as much equipment as they can while they can get hold of it and trying to expand as much as possible. They want to be self-sufficient in chips and that, but th th they're far, far away from, from that level. The U.S. seems to want to, is onshoring chip manufacturers at the moment, isn't it, too? Yes, yeah. and I think you know, that's yeah. part of another change that we've seen in the last three years is that the importance of having local supply for strategic goods, including food, uh, is really important. And so, yeah, I think it makes sense for Europe, for, for the U S for China to have look some localized chip production. It's, it won't be cheap and it won't help the ROIs for the industry, but it, you know, we're sacrificing efficiency for resiliency is what you read a lot. Um, I read a uh, MFS article that you, I don't believe you published it, but one of your colleagues published it, which I'm sure you've seen, which is um, the increase in data usage over the next couple of decades. And, um, and, it, and it has a, effectively an exponential curve to it. Yes. Um, now, uh, that uh, we are creating an incredible amount of data as it is. And yes. we are now producing tools that are creating an incredible, even more data and do it in an automatic way. What what does this sort of uh, I guess big shift mean for the companies that you're focused on? There are some benefactors to large data, um, and there obviously will be some challenges that we face. Yeah, so we've gone from this environment. If you go back to you know the Middle Ages, 
the, the paradigm for me is Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. Uh, I've read uh, it. <laughs> it's a great book. Yeah. Uh, and he's a great author. Uh, he he wrote basically the example of this library with all this valuable knowledge. Knowledge was scarce. Then we went to, you know, the, starting around the 70s, information, we won't call it knowledge, was abundant. And the trick became, you know, how do you, how do you process all that stuff? And it's just gotten worse from there. Now it's, now it's so much of it is just wrong, fake, meant to deceive you, meant to correct, but meant to manipulate you. Um, you know, the, the, the correct, right information at the wrong time can have a serious effect on your mental health. Um, so how, do, how does it affect the companies in my universe? You know, the irony is that the storage companies who make hard disks or memory they're in horrible economic positions currently. Now it's going to get better. This it's been the bottom. You know, the Q2 is the bottom, and it sequentially gets better from here. But it won't be a pretty 2023 for these companies. Um, and so, you know, I guess the, the the quick answer I don't have a great answer for you is that anything that processes data, filters, especially to get the garbage, the toxic stuff out. Um, that's really valuable. And I, that comes back to AI, but then you have to trust the AI. And the issue with the AI is it's a black box. So you don't really know, you can't re you know, reverse engineer how it gets to its decisions. If you have a sensor who says, this is not allowed, at least, you know, okay, they made their decisions because, you know, for these criteria, right. And so we can change those criteria, but. Fantastic. Okay. Reiner, um, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to let you get on with your day. Um, I hope the weather improves in Holland. Thank you. And um, thank it's you. miserable here. And um, <laughs> It's also winter. Uh, uh, yeah, it's winter rather than summer, so it's some form of excuse. But um, have have a wonderful one. And, um, and uh, we really appreciate you taking your time and, and um, look forward to seeing this the AI phenomenon play out. Yes. Thank you. This has been The Monday Call, brought to you by NZ Funds. New Zealand Funds Management Limited is the issuer of the NZ Funds KiwiSaver Scheme, the NZ Funds Managed Superannuation Service, the NZ Funds Advised Portfolio Service, the NZ Funds Wealth Builder, and NZ Funds Income Generator. A product disclosure statement for each is available at nzfunds.co.nz. Past performance is not necessarily an indicator of future returns.